it is okay good good morning everybody claudia just gave me the thumbs up and uh, if you're joining by means of facebook or if you are joining us through the website or any of you who are joining on zoom this morning we've got a wonderful group of friends who are gathered here it is a gorgeous morning uh okay i get to admit people to uh to zoom uh, so at any rate, it's a gorgeous, cool morning uh, at Ocean Reef, and uh, we're glad that uh, all of you have joined us. Uh, this morning, we are we're coming to... Hi, Pat. Good morning. This, good morning. Good morning. This morning, we're coming to the end, the conclusion, really, of, of what is called Paul's third missionary journey. And in the introduction to the notes that I think are online, are, are there with you. Uh, we, you'll see that uh, uh, in the introduction I've sort of summarized where we are and as we'll recall we left Paul in Miletus over on the southwest coast of Turkey uh, where he had met with the elders from Ephesus and it had been revealed to him repeatedly as this third journey came to an end that prison and hardships were facing him uh, in Jerusalem, that's in Acts 20. And then uh, when Paul's ship landed in Tyre, which is on the, on the coast, on the Med Coast, just north of Caesarea in Israel, uh, the disciples through the Spirit urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And then when he got to Caesarea, there was a prophet named Agabus. We studied this last week. Remember what he did? He took Paul's belt and he tied Paul's belt around his own hands and feet and he said to Paul, the Holy Spirit says that in this way the Jewish leaders and everybody needs to understand that most everybody in the story is Jewish and this is focusing on what the leaders are doing. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. And Paul's response uh, was he said why are you weeping and breaking my heart he said I'm ready not only to be bound but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus and I love the way Luke wraps it up he says when Paul would be dissuaded we gave up have any of you ever given up on somebody is saying ah, you know and 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 Luke's way of summarizing it he said all right the Lord's will be done, Paul, if that's what you insist on doing. And so what we're going to study this morning is going to be how God's will works out for Paul when he arrives in Jerusalem. So I want to, let me, Jay, invite, admit you to the meeting. And uh, so I want to invite, uh, uh, invite us all to uh, pray the prayer that we have been praying together week by week. George, good morning. And, good morning, uh, Bob. Good morning, Jay. And uh, to pray the prayer together, we've been praying week by week from God's spell. I'll just say the words, and then we'll pray them together. Lord, help us see you more clearly in order that we might love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day by day. So let's pray it together. Lord, help us see you more clearly in order that we might love you more dearly and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Well, if you look at the discover part of the notes, you see that we're going to break uh, this part of Luke's narrative down into six parts. Uh, first of all, his arrival and welcome in Jerusalem. Then we're going to look at the way in which he chose to observe the Jewish purification rites. And out of doing so, uh, we'll come to Paul's arrest by the Roman authorities. And out of the chaos of that moment, Paul then addresses the crowd at the temple. And in response to Paul's sermon, nobody said, uh, in, to Paul's address, nobody walked up and said, nice sermon, Paul. Uh, he drew a very, very angry response. And in, and in response to the crowd, the soldiers made an alarming mistake. So that's, we're going to cover a big part of the text, but it's a fascinating thing. So let's dig in, and uh, we'll, we'll start with Paul's arrival in Jerusalem. 
Uh, Christy, would you read that text, Acts 21, 17 to 19? Sure. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Okay. So how was Paul received in Jerusalem? Very, very warmly. Yeah, and who received him? The elders. Well, who received him first? Okay, let's go rewind the tape. Who was James? Uh, Whose brother? He's Jesus' brother. And what role, what key role does he play in the Jerusalem church? He is, he is the leader of the Jerusalem church. And so why is it important that James received him? Because he's letting everybody else know I've welcomed him, so you better. Okay, yeah. I've got a friend who's been to Ocean Reef. In fact, he sang at one of the uh, Easter services, Dennis McNeil. And I follow Dennis online. And he is, uh, he has a wonderful fan in London. Do you know what her name is? The Queen of England. <laughs> And when the queen receives you, what's the message? It's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one, okay? So when James received him, who else? All of the elders in Jerusalem. And then what was the what was their initial conversation all about? What does it say in verse 19? What God had done. Yeah. Did did he just give them a a, a sort of a 28 minute or an 18 minute TED talk? Probably not. He said he reported in detail what God had done among what group of people? The Gentiles, the Gentiles through his ministry. And so, uh, I don't know how long that took. What do you think? Better part of a day? Uh, I think they probably broke and had a shawarma for lunch or something. But at any rate, uh, when this is over, uh, we move on to... James quickly moves from, Paul, that's wonderful, but we got a real problem on our hands. Nancy, would you read verses uh, 20 to 26 of Acts chapter 21? When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come as do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Can't hear her, Bob. Okay, yeah, just can you see the notes, George? Just follow along in the text. Yeah, keep going, Nancy. Yeah. The next day, Paul took the men and purified them himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Okay. Hey, George, do you have the notes? Can you see them on your phone yeah I can't see the notes is, is there I'm looking oh. for the shared content okay is yeah the website. okay the, uh, no George is on zoom oh. I thought the oh, notes oh. were posted on zoom anyhow uh, get your Bible open that was Acts 21 20 to 26 okay yes, so okay. yeah Thank you. and I'll give you the reference as we go through have the notes on zoom. Okay. Uh, okay so uh, how long did their praise of Paul last 
Uh, it, it, it went on, but I mean, they pivoted faster than a pro basketball player, right? Okay, and what did they pivot to? What, what did they pivot to? Well, not to the observance of the law immediately, but to what? No, read verse, it's interesting. Somebody try and read the Bible. Read verse 20. What does it say? When they heard this thing, praise God. And they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Okay, zealous so, for the law. okay, we're going to come back and talk about this in the discussion because this is of huge importance today. So, the problem was how many thousands of Jews who have believed? Who did these thousands of Jews believe in? Jesus. They, n Jesus. Jesus. They have come to believe in Jesus, but their belief in Jesus also went hand in hand with their being what? Jewish. Zealous for the law. Observant Jews. Now, for some of us, we say those two things can't go together. But we're going to have to come back and talk about that. And so now James goes on, and what have these zealous these, these Jewish believers in Jesus, Jesus, who are zealous for the law, what have they been informed about Paul? I just tell the people it's not necessary to have the circumcision. Telling Gentiles to turn away from Moses, that they don't, that Gentiles don't need to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. And is that what Paul was telling Gentiles? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, hang on though, yeah. So now James, he expresses the tension that he's feeling in four words. What's his question? What shall we do? Uh, I think James is like a good attorney. Carol, what's the first ru rule of an attorney when you're doing interrogation? Don't ask never a, ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Don't, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And I think Jay Holmes, who's watching, is nodding his head like that. And so uh, James is asking the question, what shall we do? And the problem is they will certainly hear who are the they. These Jewish believers in Jesus who are jealous for the law, they're going to hear that, you're, that you've come, so what are we going to do? We're going to tell you what to do. We're posing the question. We know the answer to the question. And so what is the solution that they propose that starts in verse 24? Take these men, join them in their purification rites, Take out your master card, okay, when you get to the temple, pay for their expenses so that they can have their hair colored, right? No, what does it say? So they can have their head shaved. Do you remember uh, back in uh, earlier in chapter 20, Paul took a vow. What vow did he take? A Nazarite vow, what is involved in the vow? Shaving your head. And you make a gift of your hair. Okay, as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to indicate the vow. So James is telling Paul, Paul, get with these guys, all of you, uh, your head shaved, and what will everyone believe about you when they see what you do? There in uh, verse 24, the last half. What yes, will everyone no believe? There's no truth in the reports. That there's no truth in the reports about you, that you yourself, although you teach Gentiles that they don't have to be, obey the law, you yourself are what? You're living in obedience to the law. Now, does that raise a question in some of your minds? It should. And we'll come back and talk about this when, when we get to the end. Now, James addresses the Gentile believers. And in verse 25, what does he remind everybody about the Gentile believers? He said, I don't know what's going on in the background. Sounds like we've got a jet engine. Oh, it's a mowing machine, I guess. 
Anyhow, we've already taken care of the Gentile issue in Acts 15. We wrote the letter. So in verse 26, what did Paul do the next day? Took the men and himself along with them. Where did they go to perform the rite of temple? Okay, now, when was Paul hoping to get to Jerusalem? In time for Pentecost, how many people would have been in Roman? Only at Ocean Reef. <laughs> So how many people would have been gathered in Jerusalem at Pentecost? A couple hundred? Thousands. A couple hundred thousand. Okay. And so how many people were likely to have been at the temple that day? Thousands of temple. If we'd looked at it, it would have been literally crawling with people. And when he went there, what did he do? What, what date did he, did he give them? Did he give them his birth date or his driver's license registration? No. no. What did he give them? The, the, the date when the purification would end and when the offering. What did the leaders want to know? Well, I'm glad when your purification's got to end, but more importantly, show me the money. <laughs> okay. When's the money going to come? So... Here we go, and did James think that this would solve the problem? I guess he did. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody says, I guess he did. Yeah. Have any of you ever thought you had the problem solved? Yeah. And oh, yeah. you discovered, uh, not. Okay, so now we're going to come to uh, Paul's arrest by the Roman soldiers. If you're watching on Zoom or on Facebook or there, uh, through the website. Follow along in your Bible. Laura's going to read Acts chapter 21, verses 27 through 36. So, Laura, yeah. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, That's good. The, Ephesi the, the Ephesian. The yep. Ephesian, excuse me, in yep. the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Oh, well, just another peaceful day at My the temple, goodness. right? My goodness. <laughs> Is this amazing or what? No. There's going to be a problem. Uh, there's going to, Frank says, there's going to be a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Okay, so uh, when did the trouble start? When the seven days was nearly over. Okay, so how long did this vow take to fulfill? Seven days. Seven days. And who, else, who had come to the temple? Some Jews from Asia. Where is Asia? Turkey, Turkey, southeast, southwest Turkey, uh -huh. Ephesus, okay, the seven cities there, okay. Uh, had Paul been well received there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, but not everybody, right? And so who comes from Ephesus and is at the temple? This guy, okay, and who does he see at the temple? Paul at the temple. 
And as a result of that... And he just went up and said, Oh, Paul, good to see you Yeah, again. he went up and yeah. gave him a hug. He kissed him on both cheeks and said, You know, can we go to Starbucks together? Yeah. Not exactly. So what does he do? He stirs up the whole crowd. What does the crowd do first? Read it. They seize Paul. And then what do they start shouting? We need some help here. Fellow Israelites, help us. Help us. They sent up a 911. And who are they all pointing at? Paul. Paul pointing at Paul. And what are they saying he has done? He's saying everyone so that he has taught against whom? Against our people, against our law, and against this. Is that a good thing to say about somebody at the feast? No, not a good thing. And now besides, what else has he done? He's beware of Greeks bearing gifts, right? We've all heard that somewhere before. What part of the temple would Paul and these other Jewish people have been in? Well, if they were in the, they were in the inner part of the temple. They were not in the Holy of Holies. They no, would have been the place reserved for, for Jewish, Jewish men. Okay. So if there were... okay, when you are in the court of the Gentiles, right. which is the largest public area of the right. temple, how many of you have been up on Temple Mount? Okay, a few of us have been. It's only 33 acres, okay? And that area around wow. Temple Mount, yeah, 33 acres. Wow. It's huge. Uh -huh. And so you have a fence, and that outside that fence is called the Court of the Gentiles. Uh -huh. Who's welcome to go there? Gentiles. Anybody. Anybody. Okay? But there are gates in the fence. And in fact, our Jewish friends, as they have done excavation, in Jerusalem, they have found these signs, and these signs were posted. Have any of you ever seen a no trespassing sign? Oh, yeah. uh, warning, trespassers will be eaten, yeah. you know, by the dog, or trespassers wow. will be shot, or some such warning. Well, these signs that were posted at every gate leading from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women, women. women. Oh. they were posted. And it said, if you're a Gentile, you're putting your life in jeopardy if you walk through this gate. Oh, wow. And so, now, yeah, the women, they're the dead. Women were dangerous. Pardon? Women, if they the were women Jewish. Were dangerous. The women were dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> the only guy in the crowd makes that statement. <laughs> okay. And there are seven women who are groaning at that, at the, including my wife. So uh, he was endangering his life and who did they accuse him of bringing into the place that only Jewish men can go a Greek oh my word was it true no no what did they assume you know what they say about the word assume and they made that assumption and they assumed the very worst about Paul was doing so uh, what in verse 30 who got involved the whole city got involved. Uh, they seized him. What did they do with him then? Drug him from the temple. They shut the gate so he couldn't get back in. And uh, the whole city's in an uproar. What were they trying to do to him? Just trying to kill him. That's all. How many of you have? We, how many of you have seen mob scenes? either on television oh, or gosh, yeah. in, a, in a movie or you know some people have been on the edge of them I'll never forget being close to some back in the tumultuous late 60s is a mob scene something you want to walk into is a mob scene something you want to be the focus of no, certainly, not. certainly not and that was what Paul was experiencing were the warnings that Paul had received multiple times coming true yeah. absolutely so uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with temple grounds what was st what stood at the northeast corner of the temple what fortress the antonia fortress and who hung out in the antonia fortress okay the special forces guys 
all right? Because they, being assigned to Israel, was not a plum job. It was a call for special ops people in the Roman army. So the word gets back, somebody sent a text to the Antonia Fortress, and who came running? Officers and soldiers. And, and when the people who were beating Paul saw them coming, what did they do? They stopped. They stopped. Oh, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was, you remember when your kids, you know, were, were fighting with each other and you'd walk in the room, they would do what? It wasn't me. It was, it was my sister. It was my brother. So they're all of a sudden stopping back. What did the commander decide to do? I'm going to arrest him. They didn't just arrest him and handcuff him. What did they do? Chains. Two chains. And, and uh, he didn't Mirandize him. But what did he ask him? Who are you? <laughs> what have you done? What have you done to cause all of this? And uh, so how did the crowd respond to that question? Total confusion. Uh, I, I understand that when... Uh, you know, you have eyewitnesses to an event. Is their story all the same? No. no. So you've got all these conflicting stories that are going on. So the commander's solution is very simple. Where do you take him? Take him to the barracks. And as they get him up on the steps going into the Antonia Fortress, the scene calms down. There's oil on the waters, right? What's the crowd shouting? get rid of him translated somebody kill said him. kill him okay so now we come to the next section paul addressing the crowd in the temple and uh, this is a big section and it's uh, in chapter 21 it starts at verse 37 and the first thing we want to read about is paul's exchange the exchange between paul and the roman commander frank would you read uh, verses 37 to 40 for us? Acts 21. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. People, let me speak, uh, please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic. Okay, so what, what took this Roman commander by surprise? Not the Jews. No, Paul spoke to him. Do you speak Greek? He spoke to him in what language? In his language. In Greek. Greek yeah. Okay. Uh, for those of you who went to high school and studied Latin, you yeah. wasted your time. Okay? Uh, because the language of the day was not Latin. It was Greek. 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 Alexander the Great unified the, unified the world in the third century before Christ with Koine Greek. It was the lingua franca. French was the language of statesmanship back in the 18th century. What is the language that unifies the world today? English. Computer code. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, English. And so Paul <laughs> surprises him by speaking in what language? Greek. He says, do you, do you speak Greek? Oh, to him. And who did the commander assume Paul was? He thought he was, Egyptian. Egyptian. Thought he was a terrorist. Yeah. Uh, an Egyptian terrorist. Uh, and what had an Egyptian terrorist done? They had a revolt. He's he, a, an early form of ISIS, right? Hamas, Hezbollah. And he said, you're, you're leading all these people out into the wilderness. You're a threat to everything. And what does Paul answer? Not me. I'm a Jew. Where am I from? And don't you love what he said about his town? A city of no, it was a citizen of no ordinary city. How many of you grew up in a small town? A few of us did. Uh, I, mine was not real small, but there were a few towns. Bug Tussle, Texas, there really is a town. When you go there, on one side of the town sign, it says, welcome. And on the other side, it says, 
back. Hurry back. <laughs> okay. An old bad saw, you know, rim shot, please, drum roll. Paul, what's he saying when he says it's no ordinary city? It's a, a, it's a, it's a significant it's a, it's town. It's a metropolitan city. Yeah, it's a cosmopolitan city, a city of influence. And if you were a Roman officer, you would have known where Tarsus was. Uh -huh. An important city. Uh, oh, an important city in the, uh, my wife was telling me, I have my foot on the stand shaking the, the camera. Sorry to those of you watching. Okay, so Paul gets the, his permission and he stands on the steps and he motions to the crowd. So everybody uh, following on Zoom, and because this is a long section, follow, I'll read this for all of us, okay? And, and it says, Paul, this is Paul speaking, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said to them, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can, test, can themselves testify. I even attained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be what? Punished. Punished. So now he moves from talking about his background and his credentials to an encounter that we've already read about, but the crowd there doesn't know the story, do they? He says, about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting, he replied. My companions said, saw the light, but they didn't uh, understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What's Paul's question now? What, what shall I do, Lord, I ask? And the Lord said, get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. Well, my companions led me by the hand. Why did they lead him by the hand? He was blind. He couldn't see. They led me into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. And now comes this most courageous man in the whole of the New Testament. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a, what does it say? And what? Now, did we learn this about Ananias back in the ninth chapter of Acts? No, we didn't. Why does Paul bring this out now? It's it, why is it important? Because the place is packed with devoted Jews. Well, because he needs to, they, he wants them to understand who was Ananias. He was a devoted Jew, just like you, respected by all of the Jews in Damascus. So he goes on, then he said, uh, he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to what? See him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one. Who's that? Jesus. And to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard and from and now what are you waiting for get up be baptized wash your sins away calling on his name and now Paul says after that he says when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple what did he do fell into, fell into a trance who else in the book of Acts sort of fell into a trance he was on the rooftop when he was hungry. Peter. Peter. Okay. I fell into a kind of trance, and I saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, the Lord said, leave Jerusalem when? Immediately. Immediately. Why? Because the people 
These people here are not going to accept what you just told them. Okay? Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of the martyr, of your martyr Stephen was shed, where was I? I stood there doing what? And guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then the Lord said to me, what? Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So why did the crowd become attentive and listen to Paul? Back at the beginning of this text. He spoke in Aramaic. And what language is Aramaic? It's the spoken language of the Jewish people at the, during the time of the Second Temple. If, if I were to open a, a Hebrew Bible and show you a parallel column with words in Hebrew and words in Aramaic, I can't tell the difference. But someone who speaks Aramaic or who speaks Hebrew will know the difference immediately. And there are places in the world that still speak Aramaic how many of you saw the movie The Passion? That was in Aramaic. Yeah. All of the dialect in that movie was spoken in Aramaic. Okay, so when you see it, that's why the subtitles are there. It's all spoken in Aramaic. So when the crowd hears Paul speaking in Aramaic, what does it do? Gets their attention. Okay. Why did Paul tell the part of the of of his story to the crowd about his background and credentials and what he did? He was establishing those credentials. Okay, he was establishing those credentials. Why talk about trying to imprison and punish people who followed the way? They would know about that. Okay, they would know about it, but what else? He was saying, I'm probably just like you. I was just like you. I was just like you. So you need to understand this part of my story. How many of us have given our testimony sometimes? What is, what is a testimony? It's just telling our story, really, isn't it? Of who we were, uh, what happened when we encountered the risen Christ, the change that he made in our lives, and what I'm, isn't that really what it means to very simply to tell our story? So, uh, what is after Paul says, here's my background, he tells the story of his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road. Why does he tell that story? What's the surprise in the story? It's like a box of Cracker Jacks, folks. There's a surprise inside. What's, what's the surprise? The light certainly was, Jackie. The vision from Jesus. It was the last thing he expected. Where was he headed? I should never ask questions that I think you know the answer to. I just violated a cardinal rule uh, for being a bad discussion leader. Let me confess it to all of you. The, do what? The, he was going to Damascus to do what? Same thing, and what was the last thing he expected to happen to it? For Jesus to pop up and say, hi, Paul. Okay? And so, revealing himself to them. There are so many of these stories in visions and in dreams, and they are surprised, and many of them are reluctant to tell their story. Why? It could cost them their life. But many of them are telling their story, and they're still Muslims. But who do they now believe in? They believe in Esau. They believe in Jesus. And so after Paul talks about his encounter, why does he, why include Ananias in the story? Because he was a very respected person. A very respected, what kind of person? Jewish. A very respected Jewish person. And who does he welcome? and call brother Saul. So when this very respected Jewish person, Ananias, welcomes him and calls him brother Saul, what should the other Jewish people do? Be like Ananias. Welcome him and, and recognize him. Uh, nice hope, Paul, right? Uh, 
so after telling about Ananias and his baptism, and Ananias really became the person who became Paul's advocate and who want, wanted to be sure that he was welcomed by the community of Jewish believers in Jesus who were a little reluctant to believe Paul at first. How many of us would have been? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But now he talks about going to Jerusalem and having a vision. And the first part of the vision's okay. The last part of the vision, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Is this going to be received very well? Nope. Let's carry on with the reading. Frank, would you read Acts? We're at Acts chapter 22. Uh, we're at verses uh, 22 and, 30, and 23. Okay. Yeah. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. Okay. So is, is it a warm, fuzzy response that <laughs> Paul received? Paul, and what were the words that they reacted to? I will send you far away to the Gentiles. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. What is the sad irony of reacting to those words that day? What had been part of God's plan from the time that God made his covenant with Abraham? Who was going to someday that through your seed all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed over and over in Isaiah, uh, the servant of the Lord, he's going to be a light to whom? The Gentiles and the glory of what people? Israel, my people Israel. And then the prophets over and over that someday from the Jewish people, uh, this marvelous word of grace is going to go out and embrace all of the nations of the earth, and we are going to become grafted into that marvelous tree by faith. Uh, through, uh, through our trust in Christ, we become children of whom? Not just children of God, but children of Abraham. We become part of Abraham's family. And so the sad irony is that they were reacting to the very promise of God that went all the way back to Abraham, that through the grace of God, through the Jewish people and the Jewish Messiah, all the nations of the earth are going to become part of Abraham's family. So what, what were, how did they react? What was their, what did they start yelling? When somebody says rid the earth, how many of us would like to rid the earth of the of the COVID-19 virus? Okay. Amen. Everybody here. If we got if we ridded the earth of the COVID-19 virus, what would be removed? Trouble and distress. And so if they could remove Paul from the earth, what would they remove from their lives? Trouble and distress. And so what would we uh we would like to say to the virus, this virus is not fit to live, right? It's not alive. It's not alive. <laughs> yeah, we'd like it not to be alive. What were they saying about the work of God in Paul's life? He's not fit to live. And sadly, uh, in some of my conversations with dear Jewish friends, dear Jewish Orthodox friends, uh, some of the biggest barriers to our really coming to a place of understanding each other it's frequently the teaching of the apostle paul because it is so very easily under misunderstood what he is saying about jews and the jewish people we're going to come back to this in just a minute when we come to to our discussion time so now who who's still hanging around while paul is speaking from the steps in Aramaic to the crowd who has just gone bonkers again. The commander, the centurion, and the special ops troops. They've all got their helmets on, they've got their microphones on, 
They've got their M4s in their hands, and they're trained to move in on Paul and extract him from the scene, just like the Navy SEALs do when they come to Ocean Reef and do a hostage extraction on the Buccaneer Beach, which sadly they will not be doing this April because of that lousy virus that we're all facing. So uh, the soldiers in this case, though, make a very alarming mistake. Carol, would you read about it in verses 24 to 49? For those of you watching, it's tw Acts 22, verses 24 through 29. The commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? <laughs> When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Okay, what's that famous uh, saying that came from Apollo 13 as it started going to the moon? Houston? <laughs> we have a problem. And uh, this, these soldiers, they've got a major problem on their hand. So where did the commander tell Paul to be taken? to the barracks, into the Antonia Fortress. Who was taken into the Antonia Fortress? Jesus was. Jesus was. Mm. And who gambled for his garments? Yeah. Yeah. Roman, yeah. Roman soldiers, soldiers did. What happened to him when he was there? He was, he was stretched out and flogged. Same thing now is happening to Paul. Uh, he first, before you ask him questions, what do you do? What's the order? Look Flogged at it. Flog first, then interrogate. Because if you ask questions first, maybe he's not going to be motivated to tell the truth. How many of us know what flogging means? It is a hard handle with leather straps attached to it and what are, in the, what are at the ends of the pieces of leather? Glass. Pieces of bone and metal and glass. And when they're stretching Paul out, what does it mean? It means that they're literally stretching his arms around his post, around a post, as we saw in the movie The Passion. A lot of people reacted negatively to that scene in the movie. But it was terrible, but it was terribly real and so then a Roman soldier would have taken that cat of nine tails and what would he have done to Paul's back torn it apart, torn it apart. some people did not survive flogging that's how severe it was so Paul all stretched out and ready to be flogged turns to the centurion standing there watching what does he ask <laughs> a Roman citizen. You know, Paul really chose his moment well, didn't he? <laughs> uh, because if, if they'd just taken him into the barracks and he'd asked the question then, it would have probably gotten their attention. But he waited until when? He waited until they got him stretched out. And I, I just, can't you imagine the gleam in his eye as he turns to the centurion who's probably supervising this and he says, come here, by the way, is it legal for you to flog a Roman centurion who even, who has not been found what? Has Paul been to trial yet? No. Absolutely not. That's his they had, line, though. Do what? That's his favorite line. <laughs> he's used it before. Paul's used it before. Okay, because he's become experienced with this, hasn't he? So... Uh, uh, then uh, what does the centurion do? Now, the centurion's a captain. Remember, he's got a 100 soldiers under him. 
and the commander has several centurions, so maybe he's a colonel or something. So this captain goes to the colonel, and what's his question? What are you going to do? Who's got the problem? You do. You're the one who told us to, to, uh, to flog him before we interrogate him. So what does the commander do? He goes to Paul and <laughs> He says, I don't trust what you're saying. I'm going to go to Paul, and what's his question? Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Does Paul say, I hope so? What does he say? Yes, Emphatically, yes, I am. And what's the commander's retort? Well, not that he doesn't believe him, but what? He, he says, what's, what's he doing here? Yeah, did you have to pay for your citizenship like I did? And Paul said, I didn't even have to pay for mine. I was born a citizen. The commander says, I knew I was in trouble before. Now I am really in trouble. And in verse uh, 25, what did those who were about to interrogate him to do? They left. <laughs> they disappeared. What did the commander know? He was alarmed. He knew he was in trouble because what had he done? Paul could have him arrested and flogged for illegally arresting and preparing to flog him. Wow. So, this is not the end of the story in Jerusalem. This is just where we're going to bring it to a pause, if you would, today. We'll pick it up again next week. We've got a few minutes. What strikes you about the story? Anything? What questions? What observations? What what hits you in the story? Well, he, he, he prophetically knew that this was going to happen. He knew something was going to be bad when he went to Jerusalem, and he still went anyway. Uh, you know, why didn't he make a choice not to go? All right. Frank's asking the question, why, why didn't he... Why didn't he make a choice not to go? And what's the answer that we've seen? He was following God's will. He was following God's will. The same Holy Spirit that told him what's waiting on you is also the Spirit who prompted him what? To go there. And he did it matter to Paul what was going to happen? No. Absolutely not. Remember how we started? Paul said, don't break my heart. Whatever happens... I'm, I'm ready to die if that's what's waiting on me there. What else strikes you about this? This was the same thing that Jesus did. Yes. He avoided Jerusalem until it was just the right time for him to be sacrificed during the Passover. Christy is just making the observation, well, Jesus had been to Jerusalem many times, but when he went the last time, he knew that it was what? The right time for him to be there. Paul knew in a similar way that it was what? It was the right time for him to be there. Yeah. What else strikes you, hits you in this passage? How many of you had never really felt the drama before? The tension in it? Isn't it amazing? Yeah. Anything else that uh, question at all? Well, the thing I want to, Carol? Same, Carol saying it's the same mindset of, of mob behavior that took who? Jesus. Jesus, the same crowd that welcomed him on Palm Sunday, hailing him. What were they crying out on, on Friday? Yeah, crucify him, crucify him. Because Jesus didn't meet their expect, expectations. And in the same way, Paul... Uh, they, they supposed all the wrong things about him, didn't they? Even when he was trying to demonstrate that he was an observant, he kept the law. He observed the law. Now, here's what I want to come back to, and it's something that was read, if you're following on Zoom or, or with us on Facebook or online, uh, and it's in the first section. It's in Acts chapter 21, page 1, that first verse. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of whom? 
not Gentiles, how many thousands of Jews have believed in whom? In Jesus. And all of them are what? Zealous for the law. And the word zealous means observant. Here's my question. If a Jewish person becomes a follower of Jesus, is it inconsistent then for them to also be an observant Jew following the law? Is it inconsistent? No. 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 I would think so. Okay. It, I would think so. But according to this, you've got observant, you've got people who love Jesus and are also what? Jealous for the law. Je Je who are observant Jews. The reason this is important, and I've got just two to three minutes, on one of the many trips that Jane and I have taken to Israel, uh, we've had the privilege, well, let me back the tape up just a minute. I want to recommend a book to all of you watching on Zoom, to all of you watching at home, and to all of you sitting here, a book that will cure insomnia uh, in 10 minutes if you take it up to read at night. It's called Post Missionary messianic Judaism okay here's the basic thesis of the book that when a Jew becomes someone who believes in Yeshua that Jesus is the Messiah rather than trying to evangelize other Jews the purpose of their life becomes being an observant Jew and living in accordance with the law and celebrating community with other Jews well, now, there's been a wonderful group of people called Jews for Jesus, and they've said that if a Jew becomes, if they believe in Jesus, what do they have to become? A Baptist, or a Presbyterian, or a Pentecostal, or a Catholic, or something. Well, there is a tremendous movement today among Jewish believers in Jesus who say the very same thing that we just read about that period. And I, I want to say that much of the church has forgotten that there was a church led by James that was composed Jewish. of what kind of people? Jewish, Jewish people. Who did they believe in? Jesus. Jesus. And did they keep the law? Yes. 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 And those things are not inconsistent. And the reason that I bring that up and say that this is so important is because sometimes in our conversations with our Jewish friends, uh, what do we then tell them they have to do? You have to become a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Catholic or a Pentecostal. When in fact really what we should encourage them to do as they become someone who believes in Yeshua, let him take you more deeply and rich you into your own faith, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why when uh, I love being with my Jewish friends and sharing with them the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. And in our confessing Jesus as God, we are not denying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but simply that He has become the means by which we, as Gentiles, have become part of your family. Like us or not, here we come. And we love the privilege of being part of you. Well, I think that's part of what's so important about this text. Uh, next week, uh, when we come back, we're going to pick it up again in Acts 22. Uh, we're going to pick up the story in Jerusalem and then see how all of this is going to unfold in the life of Paul. So thank all of you who joined us on Zoom. Thank all of you who joined us at home on the website and by Facebook. Hope you're with us again next week. God bless. Thanks, Bob. You bet, George. Great to have you.